Hi there, I'm Adam Burton, and I'm the pastor at Central Baptist Church. We are located right on the Ohio River in Maysville, Kentucky. Thank you so much for watching this sermon. While my messages are written with my church family in mind, I pray that God can use it to minister to you. Have you checked out my other media content? Every weekday, I send out a short daily audio devotional. You can get it on any podcast platform by searching for The Daily Devo by Adam Burton. But the best way to get it is by texting at the at symbol Day Devo to the phone number 81010. This way you will get a text message from me every morning with The Daily Devo. Also, every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, I do an online Bible study on Facebook. This is an interactive Bible study where we are walking through the entire Bible. Make sure you like Central Baptist Church's Facebook page by searching for CBC Maysville and tune in each Thursday at 8 p.m. And if you receive any benefit from my messages, the Daily Diva, or our online Bible study, would you consider partnering with what with us in what God is doing here at Central Baptist? The most important thing that you can do is to pray. Please pray for me, pray for our church, and pray also for those who connect with us through our ministry online. Second, if you are in Maysville, would you consider making Central Baptist Church your home? This is a great church that loves God, loves Maysville, and loves our world. Lastly, Would you consider financially supporting the ministries of Central Baptist? No gift is too large and no gift is too small. You can give online at cbcmaysville.com slash giving. I promise we'll get to this sermon in just a moment, but I want to pray for you. You know, I pray often that my messages and studies will bless those who hear it and watch it. But sometimes we can forget that real people are online and real people have real struggles please reach out to me via direct message or you can text me at area code 305-707-PRAY. That's 305-707-7729. I believe in the power of prayer and I want to pray specifically for you. Okay, now enjoy this sermon and let me know what you think about it. God bless. It is indeed year 2020, January the 5th to be exact. This past Wednesday was New Year's Day, right? The, the first day of the year. And you know, outside of, of being just a, a normal holiday, do you typically approach January 1st a little differently than you, you might other days of, of the year? Do you, do you give it some type of, of weight and, and importance or do you just kind of just Treat it like any old day. 
You know, on New Year's Day, you're supposed to eat certain foods, right? That of black-eyed peas, of collard greens, and, and cornbread. You know, I, as I was reading that, I was trying to figure out why in the world do we want to eat those, those foods? I mean, you know my, my palate, and uh, none of those really fit uh, my, my, my eating habits. But uh, I, I, I did some, some research into this, and I, and I came across uh, a legendary Southern food researcher named John Egerton. And, and he wrote this book called Southern Food at Home, on the Road, and in History. And he said that black-eyed peas are associated with, with a mystical and mythical power to bring good luck. He said that collard greens, they, they, they kind of represent green money, particularly when you can fold over those dollar bills or Benjamins or whatever kind of bills you got. And then cornbread is to symbolize gold. Now, I've always heard that, uh, that, that what you do on New Year's Day uh, is what you're going to be doing for the rest of, of the year. Now, whether or not we, we carry out new goals or set New Year's resolutions, most people give at least a little bit, some measure of, of thought to, to each New Year as to doing some things differently. Right, whether it's to improve your health or to or your relationships or your finances. And I mean all of those things are are good things to do, but but should the new year be different for those of us who trust in Christ? See, what does it look like to to turn the page on a new year in a way that emphasizes our spiritual and, and gospel? priorities. Let's look this morning at James chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 13 through, through 17. We read the words of the Apostle James. He says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such town and, and spend a year there and, and trade and, and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then it vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. James here in, this, in these verses is, is addressing the issue of self-sufficiency, which is, is just relying on, on no one else other than, than yourself. Now, self-sufficiency can come in, in different, different forms, different ways. And have you, have you ever had that coworker, or maybe it was a, a boss, that, that doesn't work very well with the team? You know this person, I mean, maybe you are, that don't, don't admit it, but uh, you know, they, they don't want anybody else to be associated with, with, with what they are, are doing because to be honest, nobody else can do the job as good as them. You know, they, this type of, of self-sufficiency, and in a boss you might call it a micromanager, who right? feels like it, I am the only one that can get you to do what needs to be, to be done. And sadly, all of the times when you do the job, they end up redoing it because you didn't do it good enough in the first place. This type of self-sufficiency is, is, is because of, of arrogance. But we can also see self-sufficiency come about in, in those who, who rely on no one else because they've been hurt by someone else. Maybe it was a, a friend or a parent or a, a spouse that let them down. And they, they felt that pain of what it's like to, 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 you know, to be, be uh, let down and to be harmed. And so what they do is they, they close themselves off from the rest of, of the world. Don't allow anybody else to, to, to get into their life because they're afraid that it might happen again. This is also self-sufficiency and 
then regardless of what form it comes in, they are harmful to a person. But as Christians, we can also struggle with self-sufficiency when, when we quit relying on God. And that, that's what James is, is, is writing about here in, in, this, in this book. Now James is likely writing to mature believers. All right, these are the faithful Christians, the ones that show up not just Sunday morning, but Sunday night, Wednesday night, and any other time that the doors are open. All right, they, that's who he's writing to. But they're living as if God does not exist in, in their, their work life, in their normal everyday lives. See, they didn't consider God's will in their daily lives. You know, I've had several conversations recently with, with people outside of the church that, that kind of go like, like this. They, someone that they, they tell me that they, they grew up in a, in a good Christian family. You know, they, they went to, to church all the time as a kid. They went to VBS and did every, everything that, that was associated with the church. But as they got older, for, for, for some reason, and they were able to make decisions on their own, they, they began to, to step away from their faith in, in God. I mean, sure, yeah, they, they believed in, in God, but it wasn't reflected in their, in their lives. And they made poor decision after poor decision, after poor decision that ended them up in trouble. To be honest, they, as they, they think about it, they don't really know how they got to the point where they are. Um, but what happened? Over a period of time, little by little by little, they began relying less and less on God. And they chose to go their own way. But it's not just people that are down on their luck that quit relying on, on God. Now, I know countless people whose, whose stories start the same, right? They, they grow up as kids in, in, in church, but to be honest, they, it's more important to their parents than it is to, to them. And, and then when they get older, they, they taste a little bit of worldly success, Maybe it's in toward the end of high school or as they're in college and they begin to see what, oh, what I might be able to accomplish. And so that begins their focus. And they slowly find themselves relying more and more on themselves and less and less on God. You know, they... They may have an excellent job that provides them a, a high income. They can drive a nice fancy car and, and they can live in the perfect house and, and have the model family. You know, everybody that, that, that sees them, they, they, they think, oh wow, this is the perfect person that we should aspire to be. But in the eyes of the only one that matters, they are spiritually bankrupt. Verse 14 here of, of James chapter 4. James says, What is your life? For you do, well, before that, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are like a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. See, this, this verse here mentions uh, a, a feature of of the daily life that we tend to ignore. One way it is is that we have no sure knowledge of the future. When I was actively selling real estate, we, we had a, a, a disclosure that we had all the people, buyers and sellers that we, we worked with, had them to, uh, to, to, to sign. And among other things in there, it, it told them that I, as the real estate agent, do not guarantee the value of their house. Is what I would often tell them is that, you know what, values, prices go up, but they can also go down. And I don't know what your house is going to be worth in, in five or, or ten years. 
You know, and Austin, times when I was kind of sitting down with somebody to list their house, they would say, so what do you think I'm going to be able to, to get for us, and how long do you think it's going to take to, to sell? And often I would reply kind of jokingly, I'd say, well, you know, I, say, I loved, I wish I had this the crystal ball that I could just look into, and it says that you're going to sell your house for this much more than it's worth in two weeks, and then you'll be done with it. But you know what, I can't look into the future you see, we, we do not know whether tomorrow will produce a, a catastrophe or something good. But even though we do not know the future, we often act as if we are secure. You know, we, we forget that, uh, that, that, that we may be here for a, just a moment and then we're, then we're gone. And by failing to accept this fact, what do we do? We're, we're demonstrating this arrogant self-sufficiency that we know more than God does. But secondly, we, we do not understand the, the nature of human life, which is, is it's like a mist that, that appears for just a little while and, and then it vanishes. See, life is both uncertain and brief. You know, I've never met a person that does not have a, a busy life. You know, we often think, well, if I just can just get to where I'm older, the kids are gone, and I'm retired, then life will slow down. And I'm gonna, you know what, I, I found that all of you retired folk are busier than us working people. <laughs> you know, many of us, we, we have busy schedules. And in and, and those times, it's easy for us to, to plan out schedules, all right? We, we have to live by the schedule, right? But but oftentimes we plan them without considering the will of God. In many of us, we set goals for our business, right? We set goals for our job, for our career, for, for our church. We set goals and even for our family. And hear me, God, God wants us to work diligently in, in all of those areas. But we must consider His will first as we plan our goals. Let me say that again. We must consider his will first before we plan our goals. See, James urged us to, to add this, this key qualifier here um, to, um, to, to our, our planning. And that is, if the Lord wills. Now, James isn't just has kind of telling us to, to, to just to alter our words, kind of saying, well, if the Lord wills, putting it at the end of a, end of a sentence, and we often, a lot of times, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Well, you know, if the Lord wills, and whatever happens, happens. You know, it's almost like we can, uh, you know, in the South, we, we can do this, is, you know, we, we, we say something bad about somebody, and then as long as we put bless your heart at the end of it, it's okay. You know, it's like, you know, that person, they smell, they smell like they haven't taken a shower in three weeks. Bless their heart. It's like, it's okay. <laughs> No, no, that's, that's not what James is, is telling us to do here. See, James wanted us to have a new perspective, this perspective to, to, to sink in deep into our hearts and to inform every single word that we speak. See, when, when we finally understand who we are in Christ, the brevity of life on earth and the reality of God's eternal kingdom. We will approach every day with a, with a, a gospel-centered and God-honoring perspective. Flip over to James chapter 5 now. James chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 7 and, and 8. James continues, he says, Be patient. Therefore, brothers, and until the coming of the Lord, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. See, James is writing to these Christians who were likely facing opposition and oppression from the world, but they were also internally conflicted. 
And the words that James is, is writing here is, is to provide comfort to, to those in, in both of the situations. See, it's, it's unlikely that we're going to face persecution for our faith this year here in America. But we will all struggle in 2020. Some of, of us may lose loved ones this year. Some may lose a job. Some may be diagnosed with a life-threatening sickness. Some may have a child that will bring you heartache. Some may have a spouse that says, you know, I I just don't want to be married anymore. And in those situations, in those times of great struggle, James implores us to be patient and to endure until the Lord comes. The analogy, the illustration that that James uses is that of, of a farmer. See, a farmer relies on the rain to, to produce his crops, right? Without rain, you can't grow anything. And so, so the farmer waits for, for the rain to come and to, and to grow the, the, the crops, but, but he doesn't just sit in the house all day watching TV and just say, God, you know what, give us the rain, and once we get that, then, then I'll get to work, right? No, it doesn't work like that. Now he works while he waits, preparing the soil, doing everything that he can to the best of his ability. And then God moves and he brings the rain and, and grows the, the crops. And like, like the farmer, we too must make most of the time that we are given. Working diligently for, for God's kingdom purposes. And, and when we do this, oh, when we do this, God does what he can to produce the best possible results in our lives. We must work diligently, not for our purposes, but for his purposes. And when we do that, God works and he does what he does to produce the best possible results in our lives. Flip on over to the book of Philippians, uh, the letter to the church in Philippi, chapter three. It's a very uh, uh, well-known passage here that, that Paul is writing to this church in, in Philippi. And Paul writes these words. He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained or th- this or am already perfect, but I press on to, to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for which the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. See, the Apostle Paul realizes the the little importance of of earthly things. See, in in these verses, he expressed what what life truly meant to him. Look here at verse verse 11. He says that, that by any means possible that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. See, Paul wanted to be resurrected so what did he do? He, he pursued, the, uh, he pursued uh, the only way that promised resurrection. 
See, Paul had an encounter with the living Jesus on the Damascus Road. And that encounter transformed his life. See, he realized that, that the rituals of, of being a good religious person would not guarantee a resurrection. Only Jesus can guarantee resurrection. And this changed Paul's perspective on life because now he wanted to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. You see, knowing Christ is, is more than just knowing about him. Paul wanted the closest possible relationship with Christ that he could get. This morning, you too can know Christ as intimately as Paul did because it comes through, through faith in the gospel of Jesus. Faith in, in that, that Jesus was sent by, by his Father God to, to live in this world, to, to live the perfect, sinless life that you nor I could live. To die the, the sinner's death that you and I deserve. But he was resurrected from the dead and now reigns at the right hand of his Father and soon he is coming back to rule the earth. See, the Bible says that if you believe this with all of your heart, then you will be saved and you will be resurrected from the dead. Just a few moments, we're gonna, gonna have a time to, to sing, we call it a, a time of invitation. It's the time for us to, to respond to, to God's moving in us through his preaching of his word. I'm gonna be be standing down here in front and if you're sitting out there this morning thinking you know what I, I, I don't feel like I, I am saved I, I don't feel like I've trusted in, in Christ for my resurrection I may have been here maybe you've been in church your whole life you've done all of the religious things that, that you're supposed to do but without a personal encounter with the living Jesus, you are not saved and you are not promised resurrection. No, you were promised eternal death. But the good news is that you can have eternal life today. All you have to do is, is give your life to Christ. And if you've chosen to do that today, come down here in a moment and, and to see me share that decision with me so that we can rejoice with you uh, to uh, what Christ has, has done in your life. You know, no matter how long you've, you've known Christ, maybe it's just been for a little while, maybe it's been for many decades, there is no greater goal or a resolution than, than for us to know him more. See, as, as your, your, your pastor, my, my greatest desire isn't that you would have perfect attendance in worship and, and in Sunday school this year. Although if you do, I'll, I'll, I'll make you a medal myself. Right? It's not that you would, you know what, that you would increase your, your tithe and give more to the church and to, to pay off our, our building loan, although that would be amazing. It's not that you would work in, with our kids on, on Wednesday nights and Sundays and sing in the choir, although those are great and important things in our church. And don't get me wrong, I, I do, I desire all of those things. But my greatest desire is that you and, and that I would love God more this year than we did last year. And that we would seek to know him more this year than we did last year. Because when, when our hearts 
line up with God's will, oh, you better watch out. Because God is going to move in a mighty, mighty way. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the encouragement that you have provided to us through, through James and through Paul, through the power of your Holy Spirit. And God, we pray, I pray for those this morning who do not yet know you. I pray that on this fifth day of 2020, the beginning of the year, that today would be the day of their salvation, the day that they know you and trust you as their Savior and Lord. A day that they would find eternal life and a future resurrection from the dead. God, I pray for all of us, for those of us that are are believers, that are followers of you. God, in in a time where where there's a lot going on, a time where we're kind of planning now, charting the course for for the year, things we want to accomplish, things we, we want to do. God, I pray that we would be like, like the farmer. God, that we, would, that we would work diligently according to your purposes. But God, that we would trust in you to do what only you can do. God, may 2020 be the year of us desperately seeking you with all of our hearts, soul, mind, and with all of our strength. God, as we, as we work faithfully according to your purposes, God, may you move abundantly in our lives, in the lives of our church, God, and and those that we encounter every day. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.